going to introduce Dr. Simon Brumman and Ms. Sarah Sturk, um, who are going to talk about reflective practice in legal education. Are we missing an opportunity to give forward speaking space to uh, law students? Now, Dr. Simon Brumman is senior lecturer in law, um, Liverpool John Moores University, um, and a fellow of the Oxford Centre for Animal Ethics, and uh, senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy and SEEDS Award winner 2020 from the International Society of Animal Rights. Um, and Ms. Sarah Sturk is a senior lecturer in law also at Liverpool John Moores University. So if I can hand over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. I'm gonna share a screen uh, first off. Um, the resume you gave me was very much <laughs> about my animal law side. But, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to speak about animals today. There's uh, a lot of my work, actually, uh, which runs a lot alongside this, um, is is about student experience and um, teaching and learning in law. That's where my doctorate is, is actually, is in legal education. Um, I'm going to share this screen. I, I think we can all get that. So um, uh, I'll start us off, and then Sarah, who is down there somewhere as Jay Cullen, I think. We've got a slight technical issue oh, with think, Sarah. I think I'm there? back. As the, I think he's fixed it. Ah, you are back as you. Yeah, Sarah is appearing as herself and not as her husband, which is a re relief. <laughs> okay. Um, this... Uh, this uh, research is uh, quite recent, it's very recent. Um, it's about reflective practice in legal education, um, giving space to law students. Um, I would refer you immediately, really, to a, a paper. There's a paper that Sarah and I have um, done in the Liverpool Law Review, which is just out, which is um, the culmination of the research we've been doing, which is called Who Am I? Reflective Practice and Self-Determination to Redefine employable, Employability in Legal Education. So I, th I think... Um, it, it's, it, it actually explains what we've been doing in the law school for quite a long time in, 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 in uh, Liverpool, John Moores. Uh, the research actually, actually goes back 19 years. Um, and around about that time, um, we, we spotted a lot of law students leaving. So we actually, it fits in with a lot of things that have been said. We, we looked at how we could stop this and came to the conclusion that reflective practice was part of this. Um, and I, I actually stole the ideas from... from um, from social work and social policy who were in the, our school at the time and we're doing a lot of reflective work we hadn't really done any in law so uh, we brought this into the first year and it had immediate results and we've been doing it ever since um, and it did lead me to the second point there legal education looking outwards that I, I just began to form an opinion that legal education is quite insular it, it does uh, tend to look in on itself so I think that is a context for this that a lot of this work and reflection that Sarah I, uh, uh, and I are continuing is is basically look at, looking outwards to other discipline areas in terms of the research and what, what their experience is. Another context is the well-being of law students. There's, there's uh, documents out there, a lot of research about um, law students possibly being the most stressed discipline group on the planet, and which is, I don't think, uh, to our credit. Uh, so that was certainly part of this, to see whether reflection would work in the early days. Persistence is obviously very important. Self-efficacy and confidence um, can be quite low, particularly in first years. And part of the reflective element was to do, deal with that. And I don't know whether other universities have this problem with engaging students. It seems to be a perennial problem now, you know, uh, with attendance falling. Uh, it, it does vary between institutions. And then finally, and that's that's why we are here now with the, the current research that Sarah and I are doing, is destinations and employability. Where are law students going? And unlike Paul's students, I think I think he was alluded to students most going on into the professions. Most of ours don't. We only have 20 percent. And I know that nationally, the, the figures which are quoted in that article above for I had them for 2018. And in the UK, there were 35,000 and odd um, students who emerged from law school, schools. And at the same time, only about 7,000 went into the solicitor's profession. And then about a further 12 to 1,500 went on to, to the bar. So there's a, there's a little bit of a gap there. You know, what, whatever happens to the other 26,500 students, I think, is a concern. And it's an identity issue for for law. You know, we we are partly a generic kind of study, which is interesting, and we are also professional, which which gives us a kind of two-hatted approach, which is quite difficult. What is employability in legal education? Well, um, 
I think this is a very slippery little eel, this one. It is difficult to put your hand on what it is. But what I would say to summarise it is that it's it's taken as a professions to mean skills for employment of and ready students. However, there is a lot of literature which moves in the direction that it is actually about choosing the right destinations, about students developing themselves as individuals, the skills, understandings, transferable skills. Mance York, who was at John Moore's once upon a time, um, um, he came up with a good definition of skills, understandings and personal attributes. And a lot of that is so personally attached, it doesn't necessarily attach to professions. And I think that is a tension within legal education that we are seeing skills as for the professions when uh, they are possibly a little bit more attached to the person. And for legal education, this connection is, is a problem. Um, but I think, in fact, a lot of it and what the way our students and the study and Sarah is going to come to this in a moment is about the development of their, their inner selves, their confidence, their work identity, their personal exploration. That's who am I? And, and I think that's very important. Uh, what is reflection? Again, a lot of definitions of this. Thinking about thinking is probably quite a nice reflection uh, on reflection. Um, taking experience, what did I encounter, what did I learn, where did this take me, is, is a kind of generic way in which is explained. But it is about thinking about things in terms of putting it on paper rather than just um, just thinking about things, which you know people say, well, I reflect all the time, but um, it doesn't quite work like that. The process of writing and answering questions that are asked of you is, is a very different experience and the psychologist will tell you that takes you through a different part of the brain and, and asks you to, to demand questions um, in a different way of yourself. Legal education, is there a reflection out there? Well, yes, there is, but not much. I think there should be more and we'll come to that later. It does seem to help with developing skills for persistence as students look back. Um, and we have evidence of that in, in law from two studies from 2012, where we looked at diaries and reflection, and it seems to have quite a marked effect on students. It's also used, I know that um, uh, Jenny Gibbons uses this approach at York, developing approaches to subjects in law as a, as a way of looking at the way you approach the, the study of an academic subject in law. So it's used like that as well, and it is used to develop the self. So there is a three-way uh, approach that you can use for, for uh, reflection, which um, is useful across the board with all the problems that we face. Um, the barriers, I won't say too much about this, but there are barriers. I think part of that is all, already there. Lawyers don't look, tend to look outside. Um, we don't look very very easily outside our own profession. I think that is an issue that we, we, we should be addressing. Um, we don't have the expertise in reflection. Um, I think that is a problem, and it is a problem for some students as well. Well, alexithemia, there are some people who actually naturally don't like reflecting on themselves and are very uncomfortable with it. Um, I found it was about 50% of the first year didn't like doing it, um, but um, most seem to get some benefit out of it. Um, learning and teaching culture, is it more difficult to change things? I think at the moment it certainly is. We've got all these professional requirements which are... Um, changing everything in legal education, which has been alluded to in several talks during this conference. And the paths for recognition, do they encourage staff to take the, ch the challenge of change? I think we are developing a very, um, it's a monoculture of research, which is very discipline led, and it is not actually encouraging uh, teachers of law to do something different. Uh, I think that is, again, another conversation, but it is certainly certainly the case. And finally, in my half of this, um, is just to explain where this research specifically comes from. In the first year of our degree at John Moore, students are asked to reflect on the, the, the way in which they're transitioning to university. We give them lots of literature on the subject. Um, I call them sounding boards. Um, they have reflective exercises all the way through, um, which encourage, uh, encourages them to look at themselves, how they're looking at subjects, also how they're making friends. It's going to be a real challenge this time in, in, in the uh, the way in which we deliver because of the COVID-19 crisis. But that that, that is built into the, the module. Um, and I say, as I said, there's two studies that this goes back to seven or eight years. It's not always popular. Law students tend to like to do things, you know, which are concrete or about law. But in fact, you know, the evidence is that they get a lot out of it. So that's the first year. And Sarah is now going to take you through the what happens in the second year and um, because we built on it in the second year. And also what this study revealed of the students about those two years of reflective technique. So over to Sarah. Yeah, before Sarah uh, starts, Sarah, just hold on one second. Can I just remind um, those, those in our audience, if you if you have questions, 
it would help if you could just send your messages to me as the presenters are speaking, please, so that you know, any time you can just stick the question. At the end, I'll, I'll read them out. Many thanks. Sarah, back to you. Okay, so back in 2014, we actually established that there was a real issue in the second year where students needed to be thinking about applying for jobs, for training for contracts and mini purposes, and they couldn't really articulate the skills that they had built on and the skills that they had from working in part-time jobs. So I set up a second year optional module, which was based around the students going out and taking work experience that they could do over the summer or they could do actually as part of the module. So they would have classes for the first six weeks of the term and then they would go out on placement in a firm that we had agreed with them or into a business if they didn't want to go into law. And what they had to do as part of this module was every single week after every session, they had to write a diary and they had to tell us about what they learned and how they felt it would help them. And if they felt that they hadn't gathered anything from the session, why did they feel that way? And we told them they had to do this and then at given point, so six weeks in and then at 12 weeks in, they had to write an assignment where they had to look back at all of those reflections and they had to think about, well, actually, where my sort of notions of that lesson afterwards correct or actually was it a cumulative effect where they started to see the benefit of these skills and these sessions that they might previously have dismissed as not necessarily being very helpful. Sai, can you do, thank you. So what we ended up doing was after several years of this module running and it being very, very popular with students and getting a lot of really good feedback and students coming to both Simon and I and saying, we finally had the space in our degree to actually not think about when the next deadline was and where, what the next module was, but to think about, well, hang on a minute, what am I going to do when I actually finish this degree? Do I, am I doing something because I'm literally on the hamster wheel and that's just the next step? Or am I doing something because that's what I really want to do with my career? And for a lot of our students, financially, going on to the LPC or the BPTC is a really big commitment that some of them need to go out and work for a couple of years to save up the money to do. So they wanted to be really sure that this was actually the next step for them and was what they wanted. So we decided we'd look back and do some focus groups and do a study and see, well, actually, what did everybody think, apart from the students who come in our door saying, we loved your module? And what we found was a lot of the students said that the module really gave them this opportunity to think about what were they good at and why were they good at it? OK, and if they weren't so good at something, why was that? Was it a confidence issue? And actually, they were very good at it when they actually overcame that initial lack of confidence, which we found a lot of, especially a lot of the females on the module. Confidence was a real issue in articulating their skills. And actually, when you gave them these platforms to constantly do it, their confidence improved dramatically. And what we found is it really motivated them doing this module because they would have the employers come in and do mock interviews with them they would do um q a sessions with them before they went on placement so the employer became an individual for them rather than a scary person who's going to interview them and decide their future so we, we were trying to balance it out for them so they realized that when they go for an interview it's a two-way process so what we found is they said that and this is a very good quote from the focus group they said I had to explain to people outside the university and that really made me focus so it was about them assessing for themselves well, what do I want to achieve what do I want to do for the next 30 40 years with my career now I feel that I can explain my weaknesses and improve them and can use examples so this was one of the key things we found with our students when they were applying for jobs when they were asked well what is your weakness they didn't know how to turn that weakness actually into a strength. And they, they were so worried about writing down weaknesses on an application form that some of them would say, oh, well, I'm just not going to apply because I don't want to do that. I'm scared. So this really, the reflection element allowed them to become more positive in, what, in the skill set that they actually had. And they do say we did it every week and reflected on the sessions on what we had and what we hadn't learned. And this helped build my confidence. And I'm much more motivated because what we found is they saw the difference in themselves. When it came to the six weeks, they were starting to see the benefit of reflecting. It was improving their time management and they were starting to think about things. But what we found is really when we get to the 12 week period at the end of the term and they looked back, they said actually it reinvigorated their motivation for the degree. 
they realized why they wanted to do the degree. If they didn't want to go into law, Sarah's uh, she frozen. Looks like she disappeared. Okay, well I'll, I'll carry on till. Oh, Sarah's back. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. Sorry, internet connection. Um, <laughs> what? Well, so sorry. What we're saying is that also from doing this reflection and really focusing on their employability, their skill sets and their marks across their degrees improved because they had this refound focus and confidence in what they were doing. And a lot of them said that they felt this reflection skill they built on in their first year, but really honed in in this module in their second year, they felt it was going to support them for their entire professional life. Because by doing and building on these reflection skills, they thought they were vital for their entire career because they're constantly going to have to reflect on what went well, say, in the business transaction, what didn't, what went well in a case, what would they have done differently if they're applying for promotions? Well, what makes them special? Why should they get a promotion instead of their colleague who they've been working with. So we thought it was really beneficial for them. And so if we just go on to the next. This is the autonomy self-authorship one. Yeah. Okay. So what we found as well is that if you just go to um, Loretta, she said, I'd also noticed that pre professionals appeared constantly stressed. And this was something that we found that really came up was the students were saying when they went into the working environment, they were quite shocked by the stress levels of individuals in there. And they said that they felt that if they could really work on their reflective skills during their degree, they helped, they were hoping it would improve their mental health when they went into the profession because they would have a better idea as how to deal with that stress because they could reflect in a diary. They could try and deal with some of those stresses not limit not get rid of them but they could try and limit them by building on these reflective skills because they found that it really helped them during their degree to cope with these stress levels so i don't know if you want to say anything else about that one no i think that, that covers it we can cover some of it in the um in the conclusions because i think i think it's quite we slightly short of time just another couple of minutes um i, I mean it, it was it was quite revealing to 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 hear students um individual perceptions of what they they developed and it, it it took it along from being quite a personal journey in the first year about them being at university and um this enabling them up for, for a lot of them they felt it enabled them to feel more secure in staying at the university more confident in staying in university in the second year it becomes a little bit more professional looking forward and um and what they are going to get out of this in terms of future careers but also not just that but the you know their personalities who are they where are they going what do they want out of life was was a part of this and I think you know any profession wants people who want to be in it and and I think for some of them that was quite revealing so in terms of conclusions um we, we think this this kind of reflective practice does have the 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 possibility of of allowing students this kind of space to think about several things as they go through their academic journey into work um, it can be used also at a subject level. We've, we've seen that not particularly as much in our own university, but elsewhere. And this idea of self-authorship and taking control of your own career and your de destiny, I think is quite important and is part of the university experience. And again, part of that tension that we have. Um, in terms of recommendations, just a few, you know, we, we were quite practical, I think, in the in the article to say, um, um, yeah, how would you actually do this as, as academics, as well as saying why we think so just careful design over two years, lots of opportunities, developing staff, staff skills in this area and doing more research in the area because it is a, a, an emerging area that it would be useful to do that. And I don't know whether you want to add anything, Sarah, as a final comment before we take some questions. I would say I think in terms of the careful design, we really wanted to let students know as well over the two years that it was okay to change their minds. So it was okay to come in in the first year and be absolutely categoric that they wanted to be a lawyer. And then by the second year to say, okay, no, not for me. And I want to pursue other avenues of careers and to know that the skill set they had from doing these reflection things could be used across every career plane they were going into. And they weren't limited to law and showing them the transferability of the skills that they were gaining from doing these modules and from doing this reflection so that they felt that no matter where they went in their future career, these skills were going to help them for the long term. Excellent. OK, well, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Any questions or comments? I'll stop the share.
yes, we have a we have a we have a number. Um, first of all, just something I, I have to ask this because uh, in my job as career advisor here, mm. um, I am I I worry that quite a lot of the time I get into areas which touch on mental um, you know issues the, the question of mental stability and and so on um, uh, psychological issues if you like uh, I can see that students have got things going on in their head that through my you know life experience I, I can understand that it goes further than just needing training do you feel that when you're covering these areas this area of question of reflection which I'm sure goes further I mean it does go into psychological yeah. issues do you feel that the people who are handling this in your institution are, are suitably trained to, to well, cover the theory? We, we did have the uh, issues with this in the first year, uh, first few years that we did this, because what we did was we decided that the, the, um, the reflection would be um, not only doing a diary, but reflecting upon the diary at the end of the first semester. And that would be marked, if you like, and would lead to a mark, would have to be properly referenced, et cetera, by, by things. But it, it led to that being marked by personal tutors. And the personal tutors were coming to, to, to me and saying, I'm, I'm getting, you know, we were identifying issues that students had very early on. Um, and these were really coming out to the fore. We're not capable of dealing with all those. Um, but your question is whether the university was. I think the university, John Moores, was, was very good. We were actually, uh, I don't want to create the impression there was a line of law students heading for counselling. However, I would say it was, a, you know, a short queue. Certainly, um, that there were, there were quite a few people who went in that direction, and um, and also just uh, any other issues that, that the tensions that, that it, we it opened up um, a, a lot of issues we were able to address easily as p personal tutors. Yeah, I think it improved the pastoral support if that makes sense because the personal tutors were involved and they could see this development. Sometimes students are a bit nervous to come and talk to you face to face about these issues, but because you had this diary and they'd reflected on it, it enabled you to really signpost them in the right direction so that you could support them and you could really help them in a way they felt more confident in terms of opening up to you in these sorts of settings. So it developed really good links, didn't it, Si, with our yeah, sort of yeah. student wellbeing centres and they... It did. It sort of, yeah, it just made those links a lot stronger. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, I've got a question now from uh, Alex Nicholson, who's one of our speakers coming up in a moment. He says, you mentioned that in the UK, most law students do not ultimately qualify as solicitors or barristers. Do you think that providing students with these kinds of opportunities to reflect and develop their own professional aspirations sufficiently mitigates the ethical issue that law schools arguably face in recruiting large numbers of students in that context? Well, I, I've, I've always thought, I, I think it is wrong to see um, a law degree as, as merely a degree which is going to be used by lawyers. I, I think that's a real misconception that we've got. I think obviously it is a tension in legal education. I think law is a fascinating subject. I think law and philosophy is a fascinating subject. I think the history of legal development, I, I don't think we should just own it just for lawyers, personally. And yeah, you know, I, I agree in a broad liberal approach to education. I'll put my cards on the table. And I think if you want to study law, then you should be able to. Whether you use that in the professions should be your choice. Uh, students are paying for it. Uh, I, I don't see the issue with that. If we're promising the earth, and I think we're quite careful at John was not to promise the earth. We reveal this kind of information to them. And that was part of this. This is what you're presented with. To be real with them from the start. Do you know how many students are going into the professions? And this, I think, equips them to 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 reflect and and say whether that is the, the right destination for them. Yeah, I would say we think of it more as like a broad liberal arts education. We want them to have exposure to lots of different topics, and it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be lawyers. I know from my employability module, I keep follow up on these students. And loads of them actually taking the placement has put them off law. They've gone into business. They've been student union president. They've gone into, I've had them go into accountancy, which was a completely different role and route. But they said it didn't matter because the skills they got from that law degree helped them. The skills of analysis and things like that. It doesn't matter what profession you're going into. You need those skills. And with this employability and this reflection, again, they are skills that they need no matter what they do. So... Yes, I was right. We are very, very honest with them. And that's part of the reason on the employability. I have the professionals 
come in I've got people in practice partners we've got people who've just got training contracts and they say to them look it took us five years to get a training contract I still haven't got one I'm still paralegaling and we let them see the entire picture not just the straight route and we often say to our students you've got to get rid of the idea that it's a straight line you've got to understand that it's going to be a nice wavy line and your career's not going to go you're not going from a to b in one straight line you've got to be able to adapt and we try and teach them those skills right from early on okay uh, right and i've got one from uh, just bill cower um were the students given some guidance on how to write a reflective journal and did you grade the reflection component? If yes, can you share the rubric, rubric adopted? For a price, of course, I'm prepared <laughs> to share. Yeah, that's, uh, we can negotiate on that one, send me an email. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I think it's um, it, it was difficult. I, I, uh, I did uh, read a lot about this and a lot of people say you shouldn't um, uh, grade personal reflections i actually think it works exactly the opposite way around you, you have to engage students in this so the ma the mark has to count uh, students are very mechanistic and they, they want marks and you can do it you can create it around it, it was created around the things like you know making sure they re referenced other sources and how they were comparing themselves and what they'd experienced to to other law students which part of the reason we did a couple of articles on it as well so you can do it and and yes, there are, there is problems with you know what they reveal to you because that's the other side of this. But you have to deal with that sensitively. So yes, it can be done, and I may be prepared for to share the rubric. <laughs> and I think it's important to note, isn't it, Sai, that they do it in the first year where they're taught a lot of reflection and ills. And when it comes to employability, we refresh that reflective skills again. And then when they do it with me in terms of yes I do market as well but it's linked to other elements so they reflect in the second time when they reflect they also reflect on their entire work experience journey or their entire job study that they've done on the other hand if they didn't want to go out and do work experience and it is very much linked to are you describing the experience or are you really analyzing what's happened and where it's going to take you and so we we look at how they're using the information they've gathered from the module and how they're then articulating it Okay, well, I'm going to have thanks very much to you both, Simon and Sarah. Um, I, I had your former colleague, um, Michael Lower, desperate to ask you a question. Perhaps he can do that oh. another time later, but we, we've run out of time. <laughs> on the